ask that you would move in our hearts. Show us Jesus. Show us Christ. Help us to understand who you are. Help our hearts to locate deep in Christ this morning. Lord God, would you move on our hearts? Lord, we need you. Lord, help us. Help the preacher this morning to absolutely surrender to you. And may your word speak, O oh God. May there be salvations. May people today have hope and comfort and grace and salvation and redemption for your glory, God. Lord, we need you. We ask for a demonstration of the spirit and of power through the preaching of the word of God, not by wise and persuasive words or eloquence, but by your spirit, O oh God, we ask in Jesus' name, amen. Well, this morning we get to live on and digest the word of God in John 14, which is probably one of the greatest statements of who Jesus is, where he says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. But this is just a beautiful passage. And it's really very beautiful because Jesus, who is God, but he is fully man, he enters into their trouble and their trial and their grief, and he speaks life to them. And he shows them that he's life, and he brings this deep comfort to his disciples. I've titled this, Show Me the Way. The location is in Jesus. All of us are going to face trials, grief, questionings, and situations that will shake you and I to the core of our being. And often we think, maybe subconsciously, I have a solid faith until all seems to be challenged. Then we see and feel our limitations. And more importantly, where our trust is located. And that's exactly what is happening with the disciples. It's not odd that it happens. It's not strange that it happens. And I think often we think we're the only one going through something. And you're not. How many people here are struggling? <laughs> you all should raise your hands. The reality is we struggle in this life and the disciples struggle. And I'm so thankful that these disciples had the courage and, the, and maybe the, the foolishness or whatever to open up and to ask these questions that are so hopeful and opens the door to some amazing insight and revelation of who Jesus is. And I want to encourage you, if you're going through pain or suffering or trial or grief or maybe questioning, where am I at? Where's my faith at? Understand that God, that some of the greatest revelation and intimacy comes through trial and trouble. And that seems totally countercultural because you would think, oh, I'm strong. I can get through this. But you can't. And Jesus knows that and he understands that. And he desires to reveal himself in a deep and intimate way to you through what you are personally going through this morning. So that you will know that he is your God. That he is the lover of your soul. Personally and intimately. And I'm praying that the Lord would do that this morning. And I trust that he will because he is a good God. So where is your trust? I love this picture because one, I don't like heights. And two, I don't like the unknown. And he's almost trying to crane his head to see like we do. And, it, and I picture Jesus up there and he's holding him as he's dangling over that cliff. And that's what we feel like. Let's be honest. What's going on in our world is shaking us to the core. Our bubble of comfort is exploding. There's questionings all around. People are deconstructing 
everything is kind of tearing down. Now, that's not all bad because when we're shaken in our faith, it actually can go deeper. It can actually break down or seem to break down, but it actually, we can come out of it stronger in Christ. And that's my hope for our kids. You young people, I know you're going to have doubts, and I understand that. And I understand that you really want to experience what this says. And maybe us as older people have not lived that authentically as we ought. And let me just admit it, I haven't. I'm not perfect. I'm a sinful person. I'm hypocrite. I struggle with this in my life, much like these disciples. But don't doubt Jesus. You can doubt me. You can doubt us. But don't doubt Jesus, because Jesus is better, and he's pure, and he's mighty, and he's absolutely comforting his disciples here. We have three characters that come out in here, and I think I'm so thankful for it. And they kind of represent three kind of characteristics that we can take on. Not exhaustively, so maybe you don't fall in this category, but more than likely you will at some time in your life. We have Peter who's saying, I can do this. I can make it happen. I can make it happen. I know I can do it. I can do it. I'm going to pull up my bootstraps, and I'm going to do this Christianity thing. I'm going to make it happen. And Jesus says, no, you're not. Peter, no, you're not. No, you really aren't. You don't have it. You don't understand. You don't understand that Satan wants to sift you. You don't get it. You don't get your own sinfulness to the depth. You will. You will begin to understand that. But right now, you don't. And we find ourselves in that place. And then you have Thomas, who's confused and scared and doubtful. And you will find yourself at that place. Because guess what? The unknown is scary. Right? It's scary. It's almost like we woke up and the whole country changed. The whole world changed. But guess what? You did too. And we have to own our doubts and we have to own our scaredness. But God is an unknown. Jesus is real. He's seated at the right hand of God. And that's where our faith is. And nothing can shake that. Where you've been, he's been. And where he's calling you, he is. He is. Where he's calling you, he is. Doesn't Psalm 139 talk about that? Before you and behind you? Yes, it does. And then we have Philip, who Mark preached about, possibly Greek. His name is Greek. He's kind of caught in that Greek. I want to feel it. I want to see it. I want to experience it. But he's hesitant. We see in Philip, he's kind of hesitant. He's like, I'll kind of trust a lot, but I got to see it. And you got to kind of lay it out for me. And I've got to kind of see it all before I do it. And you'll find yourself in that place. And the disciples are in this unbelievably difficult place. And you would think that here's Jesus, the hour is upon him. The hour is upon him. He is just about ready to go to the cross and bear the wrath of God. He who knew no sin became sin for us. The sin offering, he was going to be rejected The father was going to reject him and pour out his wrath on him. And you would think the disciples would be rallying around him and going, Jesus, I know what's going on. How how can we help? How can we love you? What can we do? How can we fix this? And yet they're not. And I don't know about you, but what I would have done is said, "Hmm, I need another 12 disciples. Or... You guys do what you're going to do. I'll deal with you later. But he doesn't. He doesn't. And that gives me tremendous hope from my heart and your heart and the hearts that are going to be reached and for our young people's hearts that Jesus loves them more than we do. In fact, Jesus loves you more than you love yourself. And you probably think, is that even possible? Yes, it is. And so Jesus, on the night before, I mean, in the thought of he's going to go to the cross, 
And he says these words, do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. And there's this dual thing going on. They're entering the unknown, and in fact, Jesus isn't going to back away from the unknown. He's actually going to talk about something that's unknown. Has there been anybody here that's gone to heaven and come back? He's going to talk about something they don't know of on purpose. Wow. He doesn't back away from this. He doesn't say, well, you know, it's a command, but it's with complete gentleness. It is a command. Jesus is saying, don't let your heart be troubled. But he's also got this gentleness about him. He's gentle. It's as if he's saying, don't let your heart be troubled, but I'm going to bring you in. I'm going to draw you in. He's drawing them in. And he's going to draw them in through his words and what he demonstrates and what he says here, this sermon that he's going to share with them, this powerful passage. And it's very much configured like Matthew 11, 28 through 30, where Jesus says, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden. You feel that way? And I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart. And we just sang about it. And you will, not maybe, not kind of. If it depends on you, you won't. But, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And the thought there is, if you've ever seen an ox out in a field and there's just one of them, they go like this. They don't know how to plow. But if you put two oxen together... They plow in a straight line. And that's what Jesus is saying. He's saying, take my yoke and we'll walk this out together. And you will find rest for your souls because of me. Because you're yoked to me. Because you're in me. Because the location of your faith is in me. Yes, we have to come. But we don't have to fix ourselves. Nothing in there says you fix yourself. It all says that Jesus is your provider. And that's what he's doing with his disciples here. How do we know that? Because he says, believe in God, believe also in me. The reason why I find him so gentle is we can read this in the Greek in a different way. I know that you believe in God and I know that you believe in me, but let's go deeper. Let's take your faith deeper. Let's take your trust deeper. Let's experience this together is what he's saying here. He's not just scolding them. He's not just kicking them and saying, come on, make it happen. He's actually saying, I know you believe in me. And I know you believe in God. But there's more. There's more to experience. There's more of me. I used to describe it like a, a huge room. And if you, if you ever seen a huge castle or a huge mansion, it would be as if many of us kind of walk in the front room and we just kind of hang out there. But there's hundreds of more rooms to walk into. There's so much more to discover. There's so much more. Do you really want to miss out? Do you want to just hang out in the parlor? Jesus is saying, no, there's more. I know you believe. I know you know there's a castle. I know you know it. I know you know it clinically, and I know you have it somewhat, but there is more. There is more available for you in me. And what does he say? He literally is telling them to set their heart at ease. Now, something about the heart, not just your physical heart, but when the Bible talks about the heart, it means the central place of your being. It's actually incredibly important, your heart, because it affects your mind, your will, and your emotions. It's your soul or your spirit. It's what you can't see, the immaterial part of you. We see, we see the actions of it. We see the characteristics of it. But we don't see the depths of the control system. And that's what he's telling them. Do not let your heart 
be troubled. And in our time, I think our hearts are really struggling with the trouble that is around us. And he understands that. But he says, set your heart at trouble. Notice he doesn't say you won't experience trouble. And I want to read this really quickly in John 16, 33. It says, these things I have spoken to you so that in me you may have peace. In the world you have tribulation. But take courage, I have overcome the world. So what we are experiencing today, Jesus has told us about it before it's happened. He loves us so much, he doesn't say, well, just kind of figure it out. Just wing it. There is no wing in it. He's let us know. There's going to be trial. There's going to be famines. There's going to be a great falling away. There's going to be a struggle. But we are here to live for the glory of God and to help people discover who Jesus Christ is. This is our one opportunity to do that. And so he's speaking to his disciples because he's going to later talk about greater things that are going to happen. And he's talking about us as well. But first, they must have the location of their heart fixed and settled in Jesus Christ. He's not going to do that for us. We have to come to him and allow him to do that in our lives. And so often what we have to do is take our eyes off of what's happening, turn off the news, and turn on the word of God and wear out the knees. And he will speak to you. And he will give you the very thing you long to do because that cannot. There's no life in that. And that's why he says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. You're not going to get life anywhere else or truth anywhere else or how to live or the way. And so Jesus is working with his disciples. There's this unknown. There's this passage I go to, and I certainly keep going to. It's Psalm 46, 1 through 3. And I want you to hear this because this is what Jesus is doing with his disciples. In Psalm 46, 1 through 3, it says, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth should change, and though the mountains slip into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains quake at its swelling pride, there is nothing that rattles us as much as change. Well, it didn't used to be that way. Well, I didn't used to be that way. Well, it feels awkward. What's going to happen? What, what's going to happen? And this psalm speaks to that. And what do you see there? A very present help in trouble. God's presence. And Jesus here is promising something to the disciples. We're going to see it later because when he goes, he's going to leave someone. Another of the same kind. But he's not going to just leave someone. He's going to leave God, the Spirit, who is much as God as the Father and the Son. Three persons, one God, not to be breaking apart, but three persons. Wow. And not only that, he's not going to just walk with you. He's going to live in you. Wrap your mind. What? He's going to live in you. Remember we said you don't even know what's going on in your heart? He does. And he knows how to unlock your heart. And he knows how to energize you. And he knows how to speak love and comfort to you in a way that you can't even do yourself. And so you are going to even have an advantage over the disciples right at this moment. Because Jesus is walking with them, but Jesus is not in them. And we have Christ in us. In us. 
That's not just a doctrine or a saying. That's something to be experienced. And you should settle for nothing less. I want to experience the Spirit of God in me. And when I read, I want to feel him speaking that to me and touching the depths of my being. And maybe that makes you feel uncomfortable. But this is what we're going to be living forever. We're going to be in his presence, living for him and experiencing him. And this is what we have in him. And he's persuading his disciples towards this. Thank you, Peter, Thomas, and Philip. And look at what he does. In my father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you, for I go to prepare a place for you. Jesus is using covenantal language. He's using betrothal language. And he's also using absolute language. You can bank on it. And how do we know that? Because he says, I'm going. I love what Charles Spurgeon said. He said, you could keep heaven for eternity if Jesus is not there. Think about that. You can keep heaven. You can have heaven. You can have it for eternity. I want Jesus. And where he is, I want to be. That's so profound. And it's so true. It is so true, and that's exactly what Jesus is saying here is, I'm going to prepare a place for you. I'm going to come back to you. He came on a rescue mission. He'll come back for a reunion, and we will be in him forever and ever. And he's sharing that with his disciples. And he says, and you, and Thomas, and he says to Thomas, and you know the way where I'm going. I love it. Jesus asks questions or he makes these statements. And Thomas goes, <laughs> Lord, we do not know where you are going. How do we know the way? Great question. Thank you, Thomas. And Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And the emphatic is on the. It's not a way. It's not a way plus another percent of another way. It's not a way and psychology. It's not a way and politics. It's not a way and legislation. It is Jesus plus nothing. He says, I am the way. I am the place for your location of your faith, your trust, your all. It's me or nothing. Wow. He's either absolutely right and truthful or he is a lunatic because no one would say that. No one would say that, but he does. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, which is interesting because Peter, Thomas, and Philip correspond with that. They're struggling and they need to know Jesus as the way, the truth and the life. Look at Philip. Show me the Father. I want to experience it. I need life. I want to experience this. He is the life. Amazing how Jesus opens that up to us. And then he moves into this middle discourse that I think people kind of brush over. They say, well, this is all about the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus displays an intimacy. And there are promises here for us. Jesus is saying, your heart is going to be so rooted in me, we are going to be united like the Father and the Son. Listen to what he says. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you know him and have seen him. How is that possible? Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father and it is enough for us. Jesus said to him, have I been so long with you and yet you have not come to know me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Jesus and the Father are one. And when we trust in Jesus Christ as our Savior, we become one with him. 
If we have Jesus, we have the Father. If we have the Father and the Son, we have the Spirit. And Jesus is saying, you have me. You have everything. You have everything you need. Would we ever question and say that Jesus didn't have what he needed? Why do we question if we have what we need? We have all we need in Christ. And he's talking about this beautiful communion. Listen to what he says next. Do you believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? Do you see how he's helping Philip and his disciples? Do you see how he's wooing them to deeper intimacy? He's taking them from the clinical. He's taking them from the factual. And he's moving them deeper. And I think often we stay in the clinical and the factual. We are meant to experience this. I love what you said several weeks ago, John, when you talked about Jesus saying, I am the resurrection and the life. And that's factual. Jesus really did die. He really was buried. He really did rose again. Those are real facts. But they're facts to be meant to relate in relationship and experience them. To experience them. To experience who he is. Not to just say it, but to experience him. And that's what he's saying. Jesus experienced the Father. He knew the Father. The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own initiative, but the Father abiding in me does his works. And as we live our lives, it'll be the Holy Spirit in you doing the works. But you get to participate a hundred percent. Not as if they're not part of you. They're not coming from you as far as the source and the energy, but you get to completely participate in him. We have the privilege of discovering that Jesus is ours and we are his. Just imagine that. I, I thought of this as I was reading this and as I was praying and I thought, Dean, what if I really understood that? And then I, my mind kind of went to facts and stuff. I said, no, 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 no. What if I really experienced and felt Christ? Like a marriage, like a union, like being united with him, like John who laid his head on Jesus' breast. And there was a context for that. And there was affection. And there was agape love. And it meant something. And our culture has perverted that and twisted that. But there's no perversion in that. What is that like? How do we live that way? And I thought, God, that's exactly what you are saying and you're calling us to. I want to read Colossians 1, 15 through 18, if we could pull that up. I want to read that together because this is probably one of the most potent scriptures there are describing who Jesus is, the way, the truth, and the life. This tells us who he is. And so I want to read this together because it's so powerful. And think about him talking to his disciples here. It says, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on the earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. Think about that. Think about that for a second. What does that say? He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is also the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself will come to have first place in everything. What does that tell me? It tells me that this country isn't out of control. It's underneath the control of Jesus. What's happening? I may feel like it's out of control. And, oh, they're doing this, they're doing this. They're not doing anything outside of the permissible will of God. 
They're not. They're just not. And that scripture, the truth, affirms that. And I want to believe that. Because it's this truth and the person of Christ who's going to set my heart at ease when I feel like everything is out of control and when I'm facing the unknown. And then as we close here, it leads to this. Listen to what Jesus says. Believe in me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. Otherwise, believe because of the works themselves. They had seen him raise the dead. They had seen him perform miracles, turn water to wine. They had seen him raise Lazarus from the dead. They had seen all kinds of things. And think about that. Think from the disciples' perspective when he says this. Truly, truly, amen, amen, could not be more emphatically. I tell you the truth. I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also. Okay, I can follow that. And greater works than these he will do. Scratch your head. What is that talking about? Is he talking about miracles? I don't know about you, but I don't normatively walk around and my shadow heals people. I haven't raised the dead. I can't walk into a hospital and raise the dead or heal half the ward. He's not talking about that. What is he actually talking about? What is this greater works that I get to be a part of? Because I go to the Father. Remember, he's going to the Father. He's going to leave the Spirit of God. What is the greater works? What are the greater things? Pull up the slide. The first one, evangelism. That's what he's talking about. He's talking about people coming to Christ. What happens weeks later? Philip preaches, a, uh, or Peter preaches a sermon, the guy that thinks he can make it happen, and 3,000 are saved, and then 5,000 are saved. How many people are coming to Christ today? Clint probably could rattle that up. They're coming to Christ in the droves. How is that possible? Because of the work of the Spirit of God and because of the function of the church. Remember what he said? I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail. The picture isn't this. Ooh. The picture is, Ooh. we're pounding on the gates of hell to see the souls of people saved because we're connected to Jesus. That's why. These are greater things. We should be excited. We should be so excited you mean even when I'm in trouble, even when my soul is in trouble, even when I'm trying to prevent you from doing things, even when I have sorrow, even when I argue with my wife, even when I don't know what to do with my kids, even when I don't know how to vote, all the things that are faced with us, yes, he will still use you and me. He will still use us and he still loves us. That's amazing. That is so amazing. We don't have a God that we have to appease. We have a God who was satisfied through the blood of Christ. I love what my old pastor said. You are made in the shade, man. You have it all. You have it all. You own the bank. Quit trying to go in and say, can I have a quarter? When they're looking at you going, you own it all. And we spend it, and he's saying these greater things. But not only that, then he works and he says, whatever you ask in my name, that I will do, so that a father may be glorified in the son. What do we have next? We have evangelism and transformation. What next? Prayer. Prayer. Intimacy. Communion. Prayer does more in your heart than what you're praying for because it links your heart to his heart. You ever notice that? You notice that when you teach? It's like, I think I got a lot more out of that than they did. When you pray, your heart touches his heart and his heart touches your heart. Your beat matches his beat and his beat matches your beat and you're one with him. And you're praying, and it's as if you're right there in him. 
The Holy Spirit does that through you, even when you don't know what you're doing. Read Romans. He talks about that. There's an intimacy. That's great. That's amazing. That's more than the disciples had at this moment. They didn't have the Holy Spirit in them. But not only that, he says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Love leading to extraordinary obedience. You ever wonder how someone can die at the stake and be burned? Do you ever wonder how other missionaries? It was quite a while back. I was sitting next to a missionary. I'll, I'll, I won't get graphic, but I, I want to share this with the young people. I was sitting next to the missionary, and we were eating, and he ministered in some area near Yemen. And he was sitting next to me, and he turned to me, and he said, you live in the most dangerous part of the world. I scratched my head, and I said, what is he talking about? But he caught my interest. So I leaned in, and I said, what are you talking about? And he said, you're lukewarm, and you don't know it. You don't realize it. You don't realize that you guys are comfortable. You don't realize it. What allows, and he told me the story of a young person, 13 years old, who came to Christ, a girl, and her family hired her family to kill her. And they killed her. They cut her head off. They stuck it in the village and stuck it on top. And he said some two years later, over 2,000 people had come to Christ in that village. And over 30 church plants had come out of that. How does that happen? You don't just do that out of your will. You do that because of love. Because you know you are loved. And then that stimulates your love. And you want to give back that love. And the more you receive love, the more you want to give back love. And the more you receive, the more you want to give. And before you know it, you're dying on a stake. How did you get there? How did that happen? Because love shared love that shared love that shared love that shared love. And that may seem far out for you teenagers. But it won't if you go deep in Jesus. Because by the time you get to be 30, you'll know him. And you'll know that you are loved. And you'll feel him. And you'll know it. And we have to have that. Because what's happening is going to take believers that live absolutely abandoned obedience. But that's only going to happen with people who know that they are loved. In the good times, in the bad times, and in the horrible times. And I'm talking about the condition of our hearts. And that's the truth. And the word of God shares that with us. Look at Peter. Look at Thomas. Look at Philip. Look at Judas. Still washing his feet even though he knew he was a betrayer. Still loving him even to the end. Man. We're going to sing a song about our limitations, our sorrows, about how we struggle, but how Jesus makes our heart believe. He encourages our heart to believe. And the whole song talks about Jesus being better. Jesus is better. Jesus is better than the world. Jesus is better than my self-effort. Jesus is better than my riches. Jesus is what I need. Give me Jesus. Let's pray. Lord God, thank you. I am so thankful for Jesus, who is the way, the truth, and the life. Lord, we need you. I need you to be the way, the truth, and the life. I know it's going to offend people. But my soul needs you. I need you. I am lost without you. I'm sorry to offend somebody. But my life depends on it. And our lives depend on it. And those that doubt, their life depends on it. And those that are lost, their life depends on us knowing him 
as the way, the truth, and the life. The world is waiting for believers that will go deeper that we might walk in the greater things. And Lord, help us to get over ourselves, to get over all our aches and all our struggles and to go deeper into Jesus. The greater things aren't reliant on our obedience. They're reliant on your love and your grace. And that stimulates our obedience. In Jesus' name, amen.